忧郁。Well, hi, and welcome once again to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. As we continue in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, as we zip right along, looking at it in detail because it is worthy of study in detail.、Um, again, we the previous studies are all available online at our website here at BibleTalk.com, so you can go back and look at those anytime you want. Review them, invite others to come. Uh, and take a look at those and join us. Ask others to join us in this study. I think、uh, we'll all find it profitable because it is the Word of God, and the Word of God always accomplishes His purpose and purpose in our lives. So we're ready to start. And before we do, I'm just going to ask my my lovely patootie here, my、Let's、wife Alice, if you would just ask the Lord's blessing upon、Hallelujah. our time. Yes, Father, we just praise you, we thank you, we bless you. We thank you for the time that you are allowing us. To spend in your sermon, your very first sermon, and Father, we just thank you for your Son Jesus and what He has done for us, and we thank you for the Word that nourishes our spirit. And as we go forth and proclaim His death, resurrection, and eternal life for us, Amen. Amen. Well,、uh, as I said, we're continuing on. We're in the fifth chapter of Matthew. We're studying the Sermon on the Mount. In、uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapters five, six, and seven, and we'll start in verse twenty-seven、um, because we left off just before that, right? So I'm going to read verses twenty-seven and twenty-eight. And and by the way, th- this is kind of I call this this section of what we're doing in the Sermon on the Mount,、uh, looking into the heart of the matter, because what Jesus is doing is now, and we covered this really well last week. If you missed that, go back and take a look at it. Because God searches the heart. Hallelujah. So it's when it's when it, what's in our heart that's what's important here. So in verse twenty-seven, he says, "You've heard that it was said, 'You shall not commit adultery,' but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust, with lust for her, has already committed adultery with her in her, in his heart." That got Jimmy Carter in a lot of trouble back when he was running for president back in the in the seventies, because he was、uh, you know professed his Christianity and somehow that topic came up, and of course you can't understand you can't expect the world to understand the word of God. A lot of Christians have difficulty understanding the word when it comes to unsaved people. Remember what Paul said. He said that the natural man does not accept the things cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are spiritually appraised. But we're going to talk about that to make sure that we understand what Jesus is talking about. And one of the things that we have done consistently here is because words are important. Is let's make sure we understand the words we're talking about, and that we're we're talking apples and, and apples here, right? Not apples and oranges. Not apples and oranges. So adultery is an illicit relationship between a married man or woman with a person who is not. Their spouse. Definition. That's the definition. All right. I mean, that sounds acceptable. Yes. Or the woman can be married and the man not. Well, that, that's what I said. I thought you said the man has to be married. I didn't say that. Say it again. Say okay. It again. Adultery is the an illicit, a wrongful relationship between a married man or woman. Okay. With a person who is not their spouse. Okay. Right.、Mm-hmm. Okay, regardless of whether that other person is married or is married or not,、mm-hmm. right? It's adultery on the part of a married person who has relations with another person, whether they're married or not, right? Adultery comes from the Latin word adulterare, which means to corrupt.、Mm-hmm. Okay, now this is why definitions and why words are important,、so、and why important,、yes. and why the Lord, you know, He uses words; they are important. We we kind of have a whatever attitude today, a careless attitude with words, and we do that at our own expense and at, at our own danger. Right? right. Think of this because when it talks about corrupt, I'm reading from the New American Standard, but I want to read to you what Paul wrote in Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians four two. Paul says, "But we have renounced the things hidden, 
because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adultering, adulterating the word of God, but by manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So he talks about adulterating the word of God. In other words, that's, that's the use of corruption, corrupt without corrupting. I think the King James says without, you know, talking deception. But that's corrupting the word of God. Now, we're going to talk about marriage. The first thing I want to do is establish something. And you'll see as this builds, when Paul also wrote in 2 Corinthians and said, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I am jealous of, for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that to Christ I might present you as a pure virgin. So Paul in his ministry, when people were being coming to a salvation, coming to a saving knowledge of, of the word of the cross and the grace of God, he's saying, I betroth you. That, that, that put you betrothal mm -hmm. to marriage right. with Jesus Christ. All right? And I'll read you something from Isaiah 62, verse 5. He said, as, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. Mm. All right? We are the bride, the betrothed, the bride of Christ. All right? right. Now, I, I want to just take a, a, a minute here to tell you something. And this is, I'm, I'm going to be real upfront, because I've always said, you know, test what I say. Right? right? And what I'm going to give you now is hypothesis. This is, this is my belief, and it's based on not assumptions, but deductions. This is what I have deduced from the Word of God. But it's not, you know, I can't bring you to a verse that says this specifically. The man Christ Jesus has existed from eternity. Yes. All right? And this is the great mystery that Christ is, that Jesus is both man and God. Right? Right. That, that is the great mystery. What Scripture reveals to us is that what God does in the natural reveals spiritual truth. Mm -hmm. When he commanded in the wilderness that they build an ark, that was a model of what existed in reality in heaven. Right? Are you with me on this? Yes. Okay. When God created man, Adam, Put him in the garden. One of the first things he said. Now remember, the first thing before he, before he made man, he made the animals. The animals were supposed to be a companion to man, That's right. and they were companions. God had a purpose for puppy dogs, kitty cats, and I want to tell you, the lions, tigers, and bears were pets mm -hmm. back in those in that day before sin too, right? But God looked at Adam and said, "It is not good for the man to be alone." And what he did is he took from, he put Adam into his sleep and took from him a rib and formed the woman, Eve, who would be betrothed his wife, right? Yes. Let's assume for a moment that that is a revelation of a spiritual truth in heaven. God the Father, first of all, there were companions. The companions were the angels. That's right. God had created the angels at some point before man, right? And they were there, but God looks at Jesus, the Father, looks at Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, and says, it is not good for the man to be alone. So what he does is he puts Christ to sleep. Now, sleep is a euphemism for when a Christian ceases to be. All right? Mm -hmm. Let's assume, because it was Christ on the cross when he, quote-unquote, died, he fell asleep, mm -hmm. that the church comes out of that. And the bride is created out of Jesus Christ. We came from Jesus Christ when we were born again, made into new creations. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. And what happened was, this is, again, I'm, this is my theory, is that Satan, who had been the chief of all angels, became jealous because of his pride that all of a sudden he was no longer number one. 
that all of it, because God the Father had created mankind, and mankind is higher than the angels, and has this relationship with Jesus, his son, that the angels will never have. Can't have. Can't have. Mm-hmm. And I believe that it was that, that pride and jealousy that led to the to the rebellion of Satan and the, the angels that chose to follow him. That's where jealousy just came into being at that okay. time. Um, so that, anyhow, that's that's my my theory on all this. We've covered a lot of stuff, and we, as I said, this is basically it's a Bible study. It's a study of the Bible. Mm-hmm. All right, our launching point is the Sermon on the Mount, which is the most radical, and we will see just how it becomes more and more radical as we go along. All right. right. But well, it's kind of getting there now. Well, it's going to get yes. there now. It's going to get there right now. I'll tell you what. Um, because now it's not about, you know, this is in religion, in the religious practice, as it was commonly practiced, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, the lawyers, the, you know, all they concern themselves with is outward appearance. But now God's saying, I see it's your heart. Can, can I stop here for a second? Well, I, I was observing one time, a long time ago, that we have five senses, um, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and feeling. And somehow I was studying the Bible, and I said, we have five ways to sin. Be careful what you look at, what you hear, what you say, what you think, and what you do. Those are five things. All right. And he's going to not only what we do, but what we think. I mean, that's going for, for, okay, further than people me, can do can perceive. The reason I want to stop you is because, you know, I, I have preached a sermon many times on this. Because in, 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 he, in Hebrews 5.14, it says that the solid food of the word is for the mature, who because of practice has his senses trained to discern between good and evil. Uh, I, 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 don't, so I don't want to go down this whole rabbit hole where we get off into that, but that is available on, online. And because the thing is here, you know, Paul writes to the Romans and says that we are not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Well, those five senses are the input device to our mind. Mm-hmm. This is how information gets to your mind, is through the senses. Yeah. And this is why they have to be trained to sense the presence of God, rather than using common sense, which is leaning on your own understanding. Yeah, okay. So, yes. You know, spiritual well, but, you have, but the thing is, and you're, you're right in the sense that those are all, those are the things that input information into your mind. And you have to practice to train them to have spiritual appraisal right. of all of these things. Mm-hmm. So, yes, Jesus did say, be careful what you listen to. You know, we are told that we walk by faith and not by sight. I mean, you know, that, that, that whole issue. Um, so this is one of why it becomes radical, because... What we're going to see as we get into this, if you haven't seen it yet, is the division between the quote unquote the world mm-hmm. and the word. For so long, there has been an attempt to compromise the mm-hmm. church living in the world. To blend them together. When Jesus said, Seven. there's no compromise. Mm-hmm. And that's where we're going right now, mm-hmm. is because that's what adultery is. That's right. Okay? That's right. Yeah. Adultery, over and over and over in Scripture, the Lord talks about his people being adulterous mm-hmm. like going because the they're going into the world mm-hmm. for whatever. And I, I, I want to talk about that, right? It's a relationship with the okay. world. But, uh, marriage then, but I want to sorry, I want to get the basis of this. Mm-hmm. Because you have to understand, and I, I don't think, uh, in practice, I see that uh, all too many Christians really don't grasp this fact. God put man and woman together. That is, first of all, it's the first church. Uh, how do you define church? I define church by a gathering of believers in the presence of, of God. Mm-hmm. Hello. You had multiple believers and you had God. That was the first church. That is the lasting relationship that God creates. It is not, and it was, you know, it says right in the beginning, you're going to leave your parents in order to do this. Your kids are going to grow up and go off on their own. The lasting relationship is this. It is a trinity. 
Because as Al says, the answer is always three, and it's always based on you know, because it's an Im God made everything in His in, made us in His image, right? right. A three-stranded cord is not easily broken. It says in Ecclesiastes. Mm -hmm. It is a relationship between God, a husband, and a wife that is that eternal relationship, that most holy relationship. Wives, your husband is more important than your children. Yes. You need to get that fact in your head. I have seen more Christian women particularly be disobedient to the word of God in order to please their children. You better start pleasing God. And God is more important than your spouse. Absolutely. I, because that's it. That's the relationship. And that is the relationship that scripture defines. God, the husband, the wife. That's the relationship that is eternal. Okay. How does that happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happens. It's formed by a vow between the three. Yes, the three, God, husband, and wife. And yes, by the way, it does come with an instruction book. Yes. Yeah. You know, see, this is one of the problems, is that most marriages fail. And you want to know something? The majority of marriages fail, or right at the, right at the middle. Mm -hmm. I think the statistic in the United States is that 50%, half of all marriages fail. And you know why? Because so. people don't know how to do it. Yeah. And you know why they don't? Because God provided a, a marriage handbook. It's called the Bible. And the instruction is in there, and it is disregarded. Mm -hmm. And if you're disregarding the Word of God, you you got serious you're doing problems. For failure. You're doomed for failure. Because you don't know what you're doing. All right. I want you to just listen to the Scripture. Because this, you got to get where God is when we're talking about adultery. Mm -hmm. This is from Hosea, chapter 4. Listen to the word of the Lord, O sons of Israel, for the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. Because there is no faithfulness or kindness or knowledge of God in the land, there is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. Therefore, the land mourns and everyone who lives in it languishes along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. And also the fish of the sea disappear. Adultery. Over and over in scripture, the people of God turn to the world and the Lord calls it adultery. Look in Jeremiah chapter 3, Jeremiah chapter 5, Ezekiel chapter 16, Hosea 1, 2, and 3, Matthew verse chapter 12. All through scripture. Over and over and over. And, and think about this. This is from James, the letter to James, of James. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And he calls that adultery. That's very strong words. That, that's very radical. Yes. Because, you know, we think that we can compromise and be friends with the world. Gee, listen. You, you're silly if you think you can be friends with the world because the world's not going to be friends with you. Jesus Christ said, don't be surprised that the world hates you because it hated him first. It's the enemy. All right. Yeah. We're all adults here. Yes, we are. Great. Because adultery is about intercourse. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Well, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do um, you know what intercourse is? Speaking. Uh, I'm going to give you the definition, right from the de dictionary, of what intercourse is. Okay. Dealings or communication between individuals, groups, or countries, etc. Interchange of thoughts and feelings, etc. Communication or exchange between individuals, mutual dealings. Oh, yes, there is a thing called sexual intercourse, mm -hmm. but that's defining you know, one aspect of okay. intercourse. intercourse is mixing and relating and a relationship with somebody. That's why James can call that friendship with the world oh, adultery, adultery, because it's a relationship with the world that Christians are not supposed to have. And this is serious, serious stuff. In, 
the word intercourse comes from the Latin intercursus, a running between. To run between. Between what? One place between your one. spiritual life and, you know, we're, we're, it's like so many Christians, they're, what is it, parent, not paranoid, uh, schizophrenic. schizophrenic. Yeah. One foot in the world, one foot in the, in the word and bouncing back and forth between the two. That's intercourse with the world. That's adultery with the world. We have to become radical. And it, you know what? This is the time for you to start thinking about this and start making a choice. Because it always boils down to decision. And the decision here is, are you going to be radical for Jesus Christ? And the word radical, by the way, does not mean somebody who straps bombs around their belly and goes out and blows somebody up. The word radical means getting back to the root. You ever hear of a radish? It's a root. It comes from that Latin word for root. And what we're doing here in the study of the Sermon on the Mount is getting back to the root of the teaching of Jesus Christ, the training of Jesus Christ for us to know how to live and walk in righteousness. All right? It's a, well, I'm going to start right now because what this is about, if you start talking about adultery, what you are talking about is an act outside of love. Because it, right. it is... There's no love involved in it. Well, it's it's not, a corrupting influence. It's a corruption of love. Right. Because you, if, you, if you commit adultery, you are breaking a vow that you made. Mm -hmm. And you are cheating on a person. You are corrupting the love that you're supposed to have with that person. Mm -hmm. It's important to understand marriage because love radiates outwards. Mm -hmm. Love is not, about, it's, it's not about feelings. It's about the fact that the love of God, pure love, has been poured into your heart. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Word of God says that He has poured His love into your heart through His Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that love, you know, what, what is it? You're supposed to love the Lord your God with all. With all. With all. Capital A. Capital A L L. -L. Your, your heart, your strength, your mind, your soul, your, your everything, right? And that radiates out. And the first person it's going to touch is the person that's closest to you. Mm -hmm. And that person closest to you for, for the vast majority of us, is spouse. That your spouse. Mm -hmm. Should be your spouse. Well, well, it, well yeah. Well, and and, about and then, right. from That's there, right. it's the love of the parents. Right. Not a parent. Yes. But because yes. they are one, right. it is supposed to then radiate out to their children. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a church unit. And then it is a gathering of that family with another family that begins to build the church. What happens is that love is being corrupted when you cheat on somebody. Yes. All right? Now, Jesus is saying here, if you just look at a woman with lust, you're already cheating. Mm -hmm. You're already committing adultery. You're already corrupting that love that's supposed to exist there. I don't, I don't want to get too far ahead of me, but I, and I know I've taught this in other places and other studies you may have heard. But a lot of people, a lot of particularly guys, I mean, let's be honest about this, can feel condemn, condemnation or judgment. When they see somebody. They see a pretty girl walk by and they, they look at that pretty girl um, and, you know, it's like, oh, my goodness, have I committed adultery? Mm -hmm. And and I think it's important to, to understand this. And I think that if you test this, you'll find that this is absolutely true. That lust is a process. And here's the way it works. You look at something, and if you don't like it, I mean, you know, if you, if you look at the Wicked Witcher in the West, you know, you don't have a problem. You're not going to lust. Why? Because you've looked, but you don't like, like it. it. Mm -hmm. So let's take the second step. You look at something, and it's a pretty girl, and you like it. And you like it. You like the way she looks. Likes the way she looks. There's no sin there. I, you know, I. There would not be models in the world. There would not be, you know, it, there would not be an agreement on what movie starlets should look like, if there weren't a general agreement of what makes a pretty young lady. So, um, the problem is. What you're not supposed to do is let your mind linger on that. Right. Because you have no right to linger on that. Okay? It's all right to look. It's all right to like. 
But then the danger Don't becomes fantasize. when you begin to linger and let your mind dwell on that young lady. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's a lot easier for me to, to use the cars. example of cars. Yeah. It is. Um, and, and it makes probably makes it a little more easy for other people yes. to relate to it, yeah. even women. Yeah. Because, okay. Because they do it, do it with clothes. Well, you can do it with anything. That's the point. You can lust after anything. All right. If I, I, before I got saved, I liked sports cars. I owned a number of sports cars before I got saved. The fact of the matter is I still like sports cars. Although I don't have any, I have no passion for them and I have no strong desire. You, you know. watch Top Gear. Yeah. <laughs> in, in England, I watch Top Gear. But the fact is, if we're driving down the street and I see a really cool Lamborghini or a Ferrari or something drive by, I'm going to look at it. Mm-hmm. I've committed no sin. No. I'm, if it's a, a nice looking Lamborghini or a Ferrari, I'm going to like it. Sure. I've committed no sin. The danger comes when I start lingering on that car. Because then what happens is I start to think in my mind that I, what would it be like if I had that? Well, dissatisfaction will set in. It. Well, it's just, it's not even dissatisfaction, it's not so much dissatisfaction. It's just like, I can picture, what happens is I begin to picture myself behind the wheel. Mm-hmm. What would it be like if I was behind the wheel? And I start to, and you know what? That lingering, letting my mind dwell on it, is what leads to lusting for that thing. Mm-hmm. We are supposed to, ling- let me use another term. The Word of God says that we are supposed to set our mind on the things above. That's right. We are supposed to let our mind linger on spiritual things, on the things of God. That's what we're supposed to let our minds linger on. So it's that process of look like linger lust. We have, and Paul said this, that we have the ability and the we have the command of God that we should be taking thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. So don't feel condemnation when you look at something and you like it. But begin to feel danger, feel hear the alarm bells going off if you start to linger on that thing. Because that's the gateway to lust. All right? Okay. This is why, going on to the next verses, that Jesus Christ said, if your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, ask anybody about this, and they're going to say, well, he didn't really mean that. that. But that is what exactly what he means. You know what? That's how serious sin is. That's exactly what he means, because it's exactly what he said. And if you don't think that Jesus Christ means what he says in the scriptures, what in the world are you doing wasting time in a Bible study? That wasn't a parable. No. What he said there. No, because the danger, when we talk about sin and and lust and adultery and anything, you are talking about eternal damnation. Adulterers do not go to heaven. That's That's what the Word of God says. That's Mm -hmm. in that category in Revelation. Mm -hmm. They don't go into heaven. They'll not do it. Now, if you've committed adultery, that doesn't mean you're condemned to hell. You can repent. You can repent. And that means changing your ways. Get out of this adulterous situation. That repentance doesn't just mean being sorry for no. what you've done. It means being sorry for what you've done to the point that you change your mind about ever doing it again. All right? And that you seek God's forgiveness. And if we seek his, if we're faithful to seek his forgiveness, well, he's faithful and just to give it. So sin can be wiped away from your life. But don't get casual about sin because Jesus is saying you'd be better off You'd be better off hacking your eyeball out or cutting your hand off than risking going to hell for all eternity. And if you think this is silly, let's have this conversation 150 years from now and see how you feel about it. Because then I promise you, you'll know how true it is. So if that's true, we need to get to the place where we say maybe it's only a matter of if there are things that are temptations to you, that cause you to linger on things that lead you to lust. Get rid of them in your life. I don't care what they are. If you're if you're in a job that is causing you to, to fall and you can't feel it, get out. 
If you can't watch television, and there's so much filth on right. television today, right. get rid of it. Right. Do whatever it takes to get that out of your life. It is that serious. Mm -hmm. It is that serious. And these are not allegories. This is Jesus speaking, and he means what he says. All right? Now, let this go on. In, in, in verse 31, it says, whoever sends his wife away, this is what he said. Jesus said, it was said, right? Whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Well, that's just going right down. Well, I'm going to tell you, if you can't see the connection between these things, all right? Because these are all about love corrupted. Right. And they are interconnected. Now, I know, based on, listen, I just said a minute ago, that half the, half the marriages in this country are failing. So there are plenty of Christians who have gone through divorces. All I can say to you is seek God about what you're supposed to be doing. But don't take it lightly. Do not take it lightly. We have become tolerant of sin inside the church. Or we've become very intolerant of sin outside the church. Well, I don't know if that's even true anymore. How intolerant... Well, yeah, I, I, I agree. I understand what you're saying. Yeah, we, we become much more tolerant of sin outside the church. But I'm saying it's, it's a lot easier for us to point our fingers outside. And, and we talk about, you know, one of the things that gets me is homosexuality. And I am not, I promise you, a proponent of homosexuality. And just remind me to follow up on that. But why don't we have the same, why don't we have the same hatred of divorce? Uh, I want to read you this first, first of all. Mm -hmm. This is Matthew, Jesus again, in the Gospel of Matthew, later on in, in chapter 19. Mm -hmm. says, some of the Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him, and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has put together, let no man separate. Now, I, I'm going to say that how many marriages out there are put together by God? Well, let me. Uh, that's a, that's a reasonable question. And that's why in, in years of more ministering and serving as a pastor, one of the things that I say is, first of all, if you got married when you were unsaved, mm -hmm. that may cut you some slack. Right. <laughs> yeah. Because you may not, you know, I mean, you, you were living in sin just by, by every breath you took. Right. Yeah. Not, that's, a, that's either true or it's not true. Marriage, right. right. So your marriage was not uh, necessarily put together by God. Mm -hmm. And the not necessarily is important, yes, yes. all right? Because I know of a case, for example, yes. where two people who were very unsaved, mm -hmm. one person, the guy, particularly, when he was unsaved, mm -hmm. I was very unsaved. And yet, when Alice and I met, Neither of us saved. Religious, oh yes. Yeah. We both knew and spoke of the fact that we knew that God was putting us together. Just knew it deep down. Knew it that deep down. Mm -hmm. And that was, a, that was a fact. When you are, when you accept the Lord, you're born again. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things have passed away. So I can't speak to, you know, what happens with marriages when, before you were saved. But I will tell you this, this is something not to be treated lightly. Yeah. Yeah. Because he doesn't just say that he hates divorce among the saved. Yeah. God hates divorce Bec from for all kinds of reasons. Not the least of the fact that it is breaking a vow that you made from to each other, right? 
And so now get this verse. And if you don't know about this, this is Malachi chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Is that clear? I, I, okay. I don't think you can say it any more clearer. Come, how can you say it more clearer? Okay. <laughs> so, but I've been, for example, I can remember vividly one time I was in a prayer meeting with a couple of hundred people. Mm, and a guy that. stood up yes. and said, well, God is telling me to divorce my wife. And everybody said, oh, yeah. I'm like, wait, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. God hates divorce. We need to understand. See, because marriages today, more often than not, are based on selfishness. And they are based on just pure passion and emotion. Exactly. They're not love generated. I You're believe in starting and, out with a corrupted yes, love. Yeah, but I, I happen to believe, and uh, in my old fashioned, I believe in arranged marriages. Yeah. Now, you know, interestingly enough, when I was a pastor in New York, going, go, this is going back into the 70s. Uh, we had a lot of older Italian people, yes, we and we had we had actually had people in our congregation that were older Italian who had from come from arranged marriages. Yes. I mean, you know, one of the one couple that I remember particularly, and the husband has gone on to be with the Lord, so I know the the woman is still alive. Incredibly faithful Absolutely. and loves the Lord. Absolutely. Well, their marriage was arranged. They didn't know each other. Their the parents, knew. right? Their parents had arranged their marriage. They came together. That's right. Because you want to know something? Love is a choice. It is first and foremost a choice. And it's important in our study of the Sermon on the Mount that you begin to understand that. Because as we go along, you're going to see that, brother, you're going to have to choose to love people who are unlovable. It is not about how you feel about them. It is not about how they treat you or how attracted you are to them. It is about a choice that you make to allow that love that God has put inside of you to radiate outwards and touch somebody else's life. Mm -hmm. Alice and I have an arranged marriage. Yes, we do. Our daddy put us together. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Absolutely, without doubt, without fail. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for that mm -hmm. every day of my life. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have... I don't know. Divorce is a hard thing. I know that there are churches that just, they have, you know, there are churches that are running all kinds of seminars for divorced people. Yes. And some of them are good. And quite frankly, some of them are not. There are others that say, if you've been divorced, you're just not welcome here. Somewhere in there, 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 is, there is an answer. There's a balance. Right. There's got to be a balance. Yes. The only thing, and by the way, I also know people who love the Lord and their spouses divorced them and they had no say in the matter. Exactly. Particularly today, mm -hmm. because you know we have no fault insurance with cars. We got like no fault divorce. Mm -hmm. Getting a divorce is probably uh, a little easier than getting a pack of cigarettes today. And that's scriptural too, because if two in Jesus's time or soon after, actually after after Pentecost, after people started to become Christians, if one spouse would become a Christian, the other one would not. There's division there. Oh, horrible division. Absolutely. Horrible division. How, however, so it this is, is one choice. of the reasons, but it's also, it is also a matter of being faithful. Like I said, this all comes with an instruction book. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not uncommon, you know, for one spouse, it's people, they've gotten married, they're unsaved. They don't necessarily get saved at the same time. Right. And, uh, in, in my experience, and I don't know if this is a, a rule or anything, I often see women get saved Save. before the man, yeah. right? And that was our experience, as a matter of fact. Our experience was that Alice went to a prayer meeting one night and came back and started talking to me about Jesus. She had gotten saved. She That's accepted about Jesus. three weeks? Well, no, no, a month later. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. A month later, I got saved. Mm -hmm. But when Alice first came home to me, she started talking to me about Jesus. And I said, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear it. So Alice did, I don't know whether you did this out of the instruction of the word or you did it how, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, but whatever. She didn't harp and hammer at me. What she did was continue to love me, love me better than she ever had before. 
because now she had love that she never had before. That's right. She and also she, prayed up for so, but Yes, and she would pray for me consistently. Mm -hmm. All right? Peter says that men, the unsaved part can be, can be one without a word. An interesting thing is in Acts chapter uh, 16, when Paul and Silas are in jail in Philippi, mm -hmm. and God shakes the earth and releases them from their jail cell. And the jailer who is there turns to Paul and says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved and your household. A lot of times you just have to rely on that promise of God. That's right. Because God watches over his word to perform it. Just don't get in his way and mess things up. And I think that happens too, far too often. Uh, it happens very far too often. But in, in my case, for example, well, not in just in my case, Alice's mother and dad were not saved when we got married and when we got saved. My, my mother had passed away before I got saved, but my dad was still alive and he was very, very unsaved. But I trusted in that word. Yes. And Alice trusted in yes. that word. And all of our parents, my, my father, her mother and father were saved before they went to be with the Lord. We've seen this. I've seen people in my family when, you know, it wasn't a matter of me hammering them or, or it was a matter of me loving them. Did I share the word of God with them? Absolutely. You betcha I shared the word of God with them. I am faithful to do that. But I, it's not like, you know, I beat them over the head with it. No. I gave it to them as a gift. Right. And we saw people saved. My aunt was saved. Yes. I had cousins that were saved. Yes. You know, so you've got to trust God. Because I will tell you, and this is one of the reasons I said before, you know, parents, that you can release your children and let them go. Because you want to know something? They don't belong to you. They belong to the Lord. They are entrusted to you for a while. They're a gift from the Lord entrusted to you for a while. Mm -hmm. But they belong to the Lord. And the simple fact of the matter is he loves them far, far oh more than you do. And sometimes we lose sight of that truth, all right? Children are fall into that old ownership, stewardship, and possession. And everything does. Absolutely. All right. So, but God does hate divorce. I, I have a problem um, with so many pastors, people in ministry, getting divorced. I have a problem with so many high-profile pastors getting divorced. Because again, I'll go back to the idea that love is supposed to radiate out. And I've seen so many pastors get divorced. And then they say, well, it's because they were too devoted to their ministry. I said, whoa, wait a minute. There's something wrong here. Because it's supposed to start with your wife. Then go to your children. Then it can go to other families. It radiates outwards. You have the highest responsibility, pastor, to your wife. Absolutely. Far higher than you do to your congregation. Yes. And if you're not loving your wife, what makes you think that you're going to have the ability to love your congregation? Shouldn't shouldn't they just say this ain't working? Step down. Well, that's what they should do. Yes, yes. they should step down. I, I believe that. Yeah. But that's not what's happening. That's not what's happening at all. So uh, the fact is, God hates divorce. I, again, I don't say this for condemnation, but I think you know we need to get radical again. Yes. We need to get to that place where we don't make excuses. Because excuses are the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. We make excuses. I, 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 I'm just going to share one more little story. I can remember probably in 1978, I think, maybe 77, um, I was asked to counsel with a woman who was in the process of her husband and she were considering getting divorced and separation. Mm -hmm. And she said that uh, she really just couldn't stand him. And, uh, she didn't love him anymore. She didn't love him anymore. And I, oh, he was not saved. No, he wasn't. He was not saved. And my counsel to her was love him. Choose to love him. And she was saved. Yes. Yes, she was saved. Yes, that's why I'm counseling him, right? So uh, I, I mean, she was coming, you know, to the church that I passed and I told her, you have to choose to love your husband. 
I don't care how much it hurts you. Who cares how much it hurts you? Who cares? It's not about you. It is about obedience to the Word of God, and it is about having the mind of Christ. Changing and if, if God hates divorce, you ought to hate divorce. So what you need to do is continue to love that man. You need to start praying for him for the most important thing. Not that he'll love you. Not that he's going to be nice to you. Not that he's going to start bringing you roses and candy again. You need to start praying. What's important is that he will come into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, she did. She did that. And a few years later, he wound up being an elder in our church. He ended up having another child. They wound up having another child soon after that. That's right. Because God did heal that marriage. We, Alice and I had the occasion to share with a, a couple of young ladies just a few weeks back. And uh, the girl that we were talking, one young lady that we were talking to, asked me, started to, you know, just confide in me that how difficult it was to meet nice guys. Oh, right? Yeah. And in the course of the conversation, I said, what you need to do is you need to seek and find a man who truly loves God. Because if you don't find a man who loves God, you'll, he, you'll find a man who doesn't know how to love you. And that's the truth. Right. We, we also, we had told her that she had to let God find that yes. man for her. Yes. And that kind of just took her back because she'd never thought of it. I, I, I don't want to get way off on the Bible study here and uh, start giving testimonies. But, you know, we ran a schools, Christian schools, and I shared with the young girls in that school all the time. You know, the, the, the highest calling, go ahead, get upset with me. <laughs> Write to me. Write to me at office at BibleTalk.com. Scream and shout and holler. The highest calling for a woman of God is to serve a man who serves God. It really is true. It and really I make is. no apologies for that statement. And young ladies, what you need to be doing is start praying for the man that God has for you yes. now. Even though you don't know who Even he is. Even though you don't know who he is. And we have seen people oh, do that. Well, I don't remember which couple it was. One, one young lady, we told that, and she started praying for her husband. She didn't know who her husband was. Right. But she knew that God had a man. She started praying for him. The day that she started praying, she found out later, when she got married to the man that God had for her, that was the day he that broke he off broke off a relationship. Engagement. An engagement with another woman. Right. Tell me that, that this... Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. There's power in the word of God. Speaking of the word, I'm going to read the next verse. Matthew 5, 33 and 36. Jesus said, again, you have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. No, the Lord spoke to the prophet Jeremiah in the first chapter, and he said, Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. God watches over his word to perform it. What he says, he does. So. Numbers 23, 19 says this, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. God doesn't lie. And again, Titus, Paul writing to Titus said this, Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ago. And we are told in Ephesians 5.1 to be imitators. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, if we imitate Jesus Christ, we imitate him through the life and words that we have seen of Jesus Christ, who is the truth. And then he says in Matthew 5.37, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond that is evil. Why? Because there were many words, transgression is unavoidable. That's a good one. <laughs> Proverbs. Duh. So, we should just be able to say yes or no. Now that's, that's the you're really, that really has to be take training and practice in. 
Oh yeah, and yes, because you got to first of all, I want to tell you something. All of, all of this stuff, all the stuff that you see going on, the economy, the all the stuff going on, it ends, and it's going to end in the Valley of Decision. You got to make a decision. You got to say yes or no. Most of the world is just sitting around saying maybe. All right, you got to make a decision, but let your answer be just answer, and say yes or say no. If we are to be imitators of God, did you get that? If we're to be imitators of God, and he watches over his word to perform it, then we need to learn to watch over our word to perform it. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Let me ask you a question. If your answer is to be yes, yes, or no, no, somebody asks you to do something. You really want to do it, but you don't know that you can. Then you have to... You can say, yes, I will... If it's at all possible. Yes, you can qualify it. Sure, you, you can qualify it. That's all right. Okay. I mean, you know, there are, there are times when somebody, you, you want to do something or you, somebody asks you to do something, you can, you can make it conditional because you're being upfront and then, you, then you're going to watch over your word to perform it. Right. right? But if you say you're going to do something, you'd better do it. No matter what it costs. Now, Christians don't do that because the world doesn't do that. No. And I said, I don't think that there's anything. I honestly don't think that there is anything that would make the world take notice of Christians more than if we actually did exactly what we said. You say you're going to be someplace at 5 o'clock? Be there at 5 o'clock. Don't show up three hours later with an excuse. You say you're going to do something for somebody? Do it, regardless of what it costs you to do it. If you say that you're going to do something, do it. Regardless of what it costs you to do it, watch over your word to perform it. You know, one of the things, I, I grew up in Manhattan, in New York City. And in Manhattan, there is one block, basically, one long block up on the Upper West Side, um, around 47th Street. You may have heard of it. It's the Diamond District in New York. Right? Now, 90% of all diamonds in the United States come through this one block. There. It's it, pretty amazing. It is absolutely amazing because they do literally hundreds of millions of dollars of transactions a day, every day, on this one block. Yes. It is one of, I think, two or three places in the world that control the diamond trade around the world. In New York City, in the diamond district, it is controlled by and large by Orthodox Jews, Hasidic Jews. They don't sign contracts. Because they do, uh, they're, they're yes, yes, no, yes. no. Yes, they do. They do hundreds of millions of dollars of transactions every single day. And every transaction, basically, in the diamond district is done with a handshake and a word. Mazel. Which means it's, that's... That, that, that's um, it's actually, they'll either do it in Hebrew or in Yiddish, right? And it's, it's, uh, Mazel Bracha. It's, they'll either say in Yiddish or in Hebrew. Mazel is the word, uh, it's translated. Like mazel, tov. mazel Tov. means good luck. Right. But Mazel Tov doesn't mean good luck like I hope you win the lottery. It's, it's, uh, it's almost like a blessing for good fortune, right? right? Okay. So Mazel is that. And the Bracha is blessing. Right, right. So they basically are saying, you know, fortune and blessing, and they, they shake hands, and they will transact hundreds of thousands or not millions of dollars of money, no written contract. And they have been doing that for generations. Is being faithful to God's word. Well, and I'll tell you another thing. Anybody breaks the word of that place, they will never do business again. Yes. And that's, that's a fact, Jack. Why don't we have that reputation? Why do we get to the place where people can't trust what we say? Because in this people world... People can't even trust... With, never mind saying something, but they can't even trust with contracts. Oh, today. No, you're right. I mean, you know, I was, I was told when I was a child, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going... I can't get over how old I am. All right, that's I, get, I go in shock every time I think about this. All right, um, but the, but the fact of the matter is, I was raised by parents who told me 
you know, that you, you can do that. You you shake hands. When you shake hands, man, you've given your word. That's binding. That's, that's, that's a seal. That's, that's a, seal. a seal. That's a that's binding. Yeah. And if you if you do that, if you make an agreement, you shake hands with somebody, really, you know, son, you had better do that thing. And then it got to the place where, okay, no, you better have a written contract because you can't trust people unless you have a written contract. And as Alice says, today, written contracts don't mean they don't anything. Mean nothing. They mean nothing. I, you know, I, I see this, and it, it astounded me a few years ago when I saw all these sports um, stars. Yes. And they have contracts for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. And they don't like the deal anymore, so they break the deal. Yeah. So not only is it their word not good, their signature on a contract is no good anymore. So their name. What, what, well, what good is their name then? And thus it says in Proverbs that a good name is to be more desired than great riches. Well, that should be what we want as Christians. We should want to have a reputation as when we tell somebody that we're going to do something, it gets done. Because we represent the King of Kings who is the truth. And we bring dishonor on Jesus Christ and give the devil an opportunity to blaspheme. Every time, I'm not saying that you tell out and out lies. No. But when you just, well, maybe it is an out and out lie. When you tell somebody you're going to do something and you just get careless about it and don't do it, it's not true. It's a lie. I mean, you know, this is one of the things that's radical about the Sermon on the Mount. It's not, there's no gray area here, it's black or white. Well, if it's, you say to somebody that you're going to do it and you don't, then you become, you get a reputation of a well, liar. Well, you, you do, but it's it's so common today. It's so accepted today. that That's why I say it would make people stand out and really take note of Christians if we actually did what we said we were going to do in everything that we do. We need to, we need to get to that place wow. because you represent Jesus Christ. You do. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're an ambassador for the kingdom of God. And we bring this honor on it every single time that you say you're going to do something and don't do it. Now, yes, I am. I'm not talking about gigantic. I'm talking about anything. Anything. Yeah. Anything. I have a problem with a lot of my friends, uh, you know, because I was raised in New York City that time is so important. So if you made an appointment, I was a business consultant in New York City. You made an appointment to be so, and have a meeting at 3 o'clock. You showed up at 3.05, there was no meeting left. You missed it. I mean, that's just the way it was, and that's the way I was raised. So I had the good fortune to have that and that training in my life. But I need, but I'm like anybody, and I need to remember: you tell somebody you're going to do it, do it. whatever you're going to do, do it. Yeah, there are other parts of the world where you tell somebody you'll meet them at a certain time, hey. and it's just ish. Well, it's three thirty ish. Well, yeah. I'll tell you this real quick because we're going to run out of time here. Quick, um, we were in Central America. As a matter of fact, the three of us lived in Central America as missionaries. And I had an appointment one time with the, or mm -hmm. uh, the, the prime minister of the country yes. had an appointment with me. And he showed up hours late. And he said, well, that's just the way we do stuff here. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I don't care whether you're in Belize City, I'll tell you, or New York City. There are things that are right and there are things that are wrong. You tell me that you're going to be someplace for a meeting, you better be there. That is the land of Manana. Mm -hmm. And in Africa, where we've all been in ministry, they say that time is elastic. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I know something. Get serious about what you say. Let your answer be yes or no. Or if you can't do something, just be honest and say you can't do it. Or if you're not sure you can do it, don't be afraid to say I'm not sure I can do it. Exactly. Just be honest. Start speaking the truth in love. I think in some cultures they don't want to offend you. So he no, says, no. Can, can you be here at a certain time? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that goes to the issue and we'll end up on this. That goes to the issue of pleasing God rather than pleasing men. Right. Yes, yeah. right. you can't please both, all right, because that's adultery. That's right. That's adultery. Okay. No man can serve two masters. And Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you are our master, that you are the Lord of our life, and that you have poured your love into our hearts, that you have given us the ability to do these things that are far beyond us because we are a temple of your Holy Spirit, Lord God, who gives us the power to live the life that you have called us to. And we thank you for that. 
We greatly pray. Thank you for the gift of your son and the gift of your spirit. Father, in Jesus' name. Well, be back again next week, same time, same channel. And we will continue on in the study of the Sermon on the Mount. And I tell you what, you better come prepared next time because it's really going to get right at the next time. Till then, may the Lord bless you. Only by grace can we enter. Only by grace.